Financing is something that students struggle with. As a grad student at Harvard Business School, today's guest founded an innovative company that treats educational financing as an investment in your future and not a debt to be saddled with. Learn more in today's interview. Welcome to Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. Your host is Accepted's founder and world-renowned admissions guru, Linda Abraham. At Accepted, our mission is to get you to that unforgettable moment when you read your acceptance email and shout, yes, I'm in, confident you'll be attending the perfect program to help you launch the career of your dreams. Welcome to the 495th episode of Admission Straight Talk. Thanks for tuning in. I don't usually plug Accepted Services on this podcast, but Accepted is having a fantastic special, the last one of 2022, and I would be remiss if I didn't share this news with Admission Straight Talks listeners. You can save up to $1,000 on Accepted Services between now and November 14th. You pre-meds looking to next year, now is your opportunity to lock in a package at this very special rate and start early. For those of you with December and January deadlines, interested in a few hours of invaluable editing and advising, you too can save. Use coupon code SAVE now, but hurry. Go to accept.com and choose the type of service that's best for you. This special ends November 14th. I'd like to welcome back to Admission Straight Talk, Tess Michaels, founder and CEO of Stride Funding. A little bit of background about Tess. Tess graduated from Penn with a bachelor's in applied science and another bachelor's from the Wharton School in Global Impact Investing and Operations Management. While at Penn, she founded Sociana, a platform to democratize giving and promote corporate volunteerism that was acquired in 2018. After graduation and being accepted to Harvard's 2 plus 2 program, she worked at Goldman Sachs as an analyst for two years and then at Vista Equity Partners as a private equity associate. As soon as she arrived at Harvard Business School, she founded Stride Funding, and we're going to learn a lot more about it in just a couple <laughs> of seconds. Tess, welcome back to Admission Straight Talk. Thank you so much for having me, Linda. Loved it the first time around and excited to dig in more together. Great. All right. Can you give us an overview of Stride Funding's approach to student financing and how it differs from traditional student loans? Yeah, absolutely. So as you mentioned, you know, I was actually inspired by my own experience as a student when founding Stride. I, you know, was part of the two plus two program at Harvard, knew I was going to pursue my MBA and candidly, you know, went through the back and forth of, is it worth it to go back to school? I mean, that sticker price is just so hefty. And I realized a lot of my peers were in the same boat. And I was even asking, I mean, everyone, just Uber drivers, you know, uh, people at different meetings and conferences, if you could solve one thing, what would it be? And everyone kept saying, I want to go back to school, but, you know, the costs are prohibitive and I have no guarantee around the outcomes. And so I became really fascinated with two concepts. One, how do we actually structure products to align incentives and, you know, naturally tied to the outcomes that students receive? And secondly, how do we increase access? I found it so backwards that despite going to a great school, great program, almost every lender asked about if you know students have cosigners. Actually, 92% of private loans require a cosigner, which really just means a wealthy parent or family member who has a clean credit score who you know can guarantee your, your loan. And to me, that felt like such a backwards system because the whole point of going to school is to do better than your family and to create that future potential in your growth. And so I'm happy to walk through the ways that we've addressed this with Strides products, but that was really the nugget of where we started. That was the starting point, the motivation. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Right. So in preparing for our call, I, I watched a video and with you and yeah. uh, you said that Stride has three products. Can you describe them? And I guess that will directly yeah. answer how you, you, you've addressed Absolutely. this problem. Absolutely. So, um, so we have three products in market and continuing to grow our product set. They range on the spectrum of product differentiation and then uh, differentiation on access. So each of our products are non-cosigner based. So anytime you come to Stride, you know that you are going to be evaluated based on your future potential, not your historical background. And so that's really a tenant or a core belief at Stride. With that being said, we have products that are more traditional non-cosigner loans. We have products that are as innovative as income share agreements, where you pay a, a fixed percentage of your income over a set number of years. And then we have products that are kind of in between where you only make payments when you're earning. And when you are earning, they're fixed dollar amounts that you make. 
And so again, uh, we have three products in market now and uh, continue to think about different ways to adapt them as student needs evolve. Now, the income share agreement, that was the, the first one, wasn't it? That was, yes. that was the focus, at least initially. Yes. Right? Yeah. And how does, how does that work? And how does one qualify for a stride funding income share agreement? Yes. So you're exactly right. That was really uh, the initial you know, brainchild around stride as far as how students would be able to apply for it. So we really wanted to change the entire student lending experience end to end. Oftentimes, as we mentioned, there's a lot of restrictions on being able to get access to funding. The process itself is not that student centric and takes a lot of time to even know if you're going to be approved. And there's not any support on the back end to make sure that you know, lenders are actually your supporters. And so we addressed each of these. First of all, applying is as simple as going on our website and within 15, 20 seconds, you can see if you're eligible for funding. The full application end to end takes 10 minutes to do and you'll know if you're fully approved same day. And once students are actually approved into Stride Funding's ecosystem, we have all sorts of wraparound support to make sure that they know they really have a partner not just a provider. So for example, we support a lot of nurses. So we have access to NCLEX prep, which is nursing exam prep. And so, you know, that's really how we've thought through it. And then as far as the actual product structure, again, it is meant to really create this sense of security or this peace of mind around affordability for students. So first of all, our contracts are only up to five years long, which is very short, five years of, of making payments relative to a lot of loans that are 10 to 20 years long. And uh, you only make payments when you're earning above a certain amount and you don't accrue any expenses while you're in school or during points of non-payment. So again, really focused on putting the student first. So there's no accrued interest, let's say? if No, which is very different than a yeah. traditional loan product. Yeah. yeah. How does one qualify for Stride funding? I mean, yeah. you, you say it's all future-based. Does your credit to date matter? So great, great question. As far as eligibility, uh, right now we focus on students who are within two years of graduation. So MBA students, um, you know, nursing students, the programs are very varied. And we really look at credit as far as ensuring students have clean credit, which just means if you have little to no credit, that's okay. Actually, I think, you know, one of the issues more broadly is there's, you know, the amount of financial literacy in the States is something we could definitely improve on. But a lot of students just don't know that they should open up a credit card early and build credit for seven years to really, you know, increase their, their likelihood. But that's totally fine. We just make sure that students don't have derogatory marks or bad credit. And how much would, will Stride lend a student? And you mm -hmm. mentioned they have to be within two years of graduation. So that obviously would mean let's say a first year med student would not qualify. It's a four year program. What about those, those kinds of questions? Yes, yeah, so typically students, we always advise that they take out grants or scholarships first. Free money is better than anything you have to <laughs> have as a real obligation. Then students typically look at subsidized federal loans. And then after that, when they're looking at grad plus, which of course is you know, unsubsidized federal loans that oftentimes have origination fees, versus private loans, then they also should look at Stride. And so we typically fund up to $25,000 per year, so $50,000 per student. There are exceptions to the rule, but that that actually ends up being around what our you know, average borrower for degree programs needs. And do students end, end up paying about the same or less or, or more in total repayment yeah. when compared to traditional private loans? Yes, great question. So um, for our degree programs, Nearly all of our capital comes from large impact investors and large nonprofits, and so it's meant to be very affordable. Typically, we look at our costs being relatively, you know, for the for an expected student, relatively similar to what you would pay for federal loans. However, with a lot more protections built in around not making payments when you're not earning. So again, you know, really thinking about you know making sure that affordability is uh, the one of the most important factors. Right. Now, back in September, I saw the following announcement, quote, it's a big day for the space, a big day for Stride Funding, and a big day for students. We are ecstatic to announce that our team at Stride Funding just launched an income share financing program alongside Stanford Law and the new nonprofit, the Flywheel Fund for Career Choice. The program is designed to make it easier for students to select careers focused on impact, mission, and interest, rather than simply pursuing the highest salary. Can you explain? Yes. So this is a really exciting initiative for the whole team. We essentially looked at this and said, 
how do we create a evergreen fund where for programs where there tends to be almost misalignment around what students want to pursue versus the cost of education, how do we tackle that head on with products like income share agreements where inherently everything is tied to outcomes? So similar to MBA programs, law school programs, oftentimes you see a lot of students pursuing corporate law, even though they really wanted to do public work. And so we had some really great partners and supporters who were the folks who brought the inspiration towards Stride. We then partnered with them and said, okay, we'll structure this such that every single dollar recouped goes back into funding more students. Students pay a percentage of income. So if they earn less, they pursue public work, they pay less. And the maximum a student will ever pay is what they would have paid had they taken out federal funding. And so even if a student does decide to pursue corporate law, again, they still have, at the end of the day, an affordable product. And so for us, this was really a win-win-win where, you know, this creates a way for the school to be able to actually support students pursuing more diverse paths, allows students to really focus on what their passions are and make sure that cost is not a barrier for anyone. And how is it self-perpetuating? That I didn't quite quite get. Maybe I missed it. So, no. So again, we had worked to set up a, a separate nonprofit with capital from alumni and other folks in the in the space. Mm-hmm. And every dollar that is now being lent out to these students, when it is recouped, will go back into the fund to fund future students. Got it. And so that really allows it to be evergreen. Do you see other law schools or maybe other programs, MPA uh, programs, following for- Stanford leads? Yes, so we already are um, deep in talks. We had a lot of inbounds following this from peers of Stanford's, both in law programs and then other degree programs as well. So we actually see this being a model that could be applicable much more broadly. Wonderful. Now, Stride started in the MBA world, right? That's that's mm-hmm. obviously your background. And I, and I think when we spoke, you were very much focused on the MBA world, but it has expanded enormously. What are some of the fields that Stride is, is currently serving? You mentioned nursing, but what yes. Else? Yeah. So the, the biggest segments that we focus on are STEM, so engineering, data science, healthcare, like nursing and business. Um, so those are our three biggest segments, but there are a lot of other fields that we support, for example, education, where teachers tend to have very you know low variability professions post-graduation. And so again, I think as we grow, we've naturally tried to find ways to be able to offer our products to a broader suite of students across more diverse set of programs. Correct me if I'm wrong. This seems to work most most effectively when students have the potential for high earnings. Mm-hmm. But if the potential, if the salaries in a specific field are lower, does it still work? Oh, great question. So just to be clear, in a lot of ways, where it works best is predictability around okay. the earnings, but not about the absolute number. So a teacher is a great example. Yeah. Because we're able to structure the product differently. We know to a very high degree of certainty, what someone who's pursuing, let's just say a master's of education is likely to earn. Mm -hmm. And so we just structure the product for that type of earnings differently around what is the minimum income threshold? Perhaps it should be a a different number. How do we think about the percentage of income based on the expectations on the back end? So I would not say in any way it is better or worse based on high or low earning professions, but variability is probably the biggest impact. Got it. All right. That, thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, of course. Now, you mentioned earlier that Stride provides support to its borrowers beyond just the money lent mm-hmm. and, and the favorable terms. Can you and you mentioned, you know, test prep discounts, I guess. Can you can you also touch on some of this, this other support that Stride yeah. provides its borrowers? And this is an area where we continue to, you know, think about ways to evolve. Um, and a lot of it is figuring out, you know, for any set number of hours a student has in the day. What are the tools they actually will utilize, right? Because more isn't always better. I think vetting actually high quality tools that are going to add value is is, um, really, you know, how we focus. And so we've really thought about this as far as a few key buckets. One is, you know, when students are, let's just say, in school, how do we think about access exactly, like you said, to exam prep, ways to really improve, you know, um, their ability to track progress while in school, Once they have officially graduated, the next step is applying for jobs. So we've partnered with players like Teal that, you know, create job tracking systems so students can actually manage where they're applying. We've also looked at 
uh, certain tools where students can essentially scan their resume and then scan the job description and see what are the right phrases or things to include that will be able to appeal to a certain employer. And then lastly, you know, uh, we really create an open network for students to reach out when they have questions around their own job search process. But again, you know, it's the early innings. I, you know, I also think that we have the benefit of getting to see a lot of schools that you know, have done it well. And I, I do think we've seen some of that actually in the non-degree space, if you've ever heard of these boot camps that sure. do upskilling and reskilling around learning to do software engineering in a set number of, you know, number of months. Those programs actually have built pretty robust career offerings sure. um, and support because the point of it is to say, it's not just the degree that matters, but it's really around making sure that you are placed into a job with meaningful salary uplift. And so it's been great to just learn lessons from players like that as well. I mean, we've been focusing, or at least I've been focusing very much on the on the graduate market and that's that's Mission Straight Talks focus, but do you also lend to undergrads that are let's yeah. say juniors or seniors? Great, great question. So we fund students within two years of graduation currently, and of course, always looking to expand. So that includes all master's programs, undergrad students who are in the later half of their, their programs. And then we also expanded during COVID to support students in non-degree programs that are really high quality. And again, it's amazing looking at, you know, when you and I first spoke years ago, we were a single product company focused in one specific market, just with our direct-to-consumer offering. And now we've expanded to three products, you know, nearly 10,000 students um, across degree and non-degree. It's just amazing. amazing to see, yeah, how much is, has changed. That so. is fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you. Now, it's a few years since we spoke. It's also a few years since you graduated from Harvard Business yes. School. You had an outstanding foundation in business and you mentioned, you know, the, the cost of the education. You also yeah. had a significant opportunity cost given what you've been doing previously. Do you feel the degree was worth your investment in time and money, both the out-of-pocket variety and the opportunity cost? Why or why not? I appreciate you asking. And candidly, I 100% think it was worth it. And in the moment, it was a tough decision, right? Like you said, I was in a private equity investing job and earning well, enjoyed the work, made the leap. And business school in so many ways was an accelerant for this next chapter of my life where, you know, I was really able to one, you know, surround myself with amazing mentors and peers who helped guide me as I built Stride. I'm still very close with a number of my professors. I actually was just back. Our team is based in Boston. I was just back meeting with uh, one of my professors who I did multiple independent projects with while at business school focused on building stride, Jeff Buskang. And it was great to catch up with him and, you know, just share what I've learned and get his advice as we think about some additional growth vectors. I also am still very close with a number of my friends who are also founders coming out of business school. I feel like we're going through similar paths, similar journeys and building our businesses um, and growing our teams. And, you know, I also got a lot of exposure to folks who then became investors in Stride who were connected through the Harvard Business School Network, um, like Deborah Quazo and, and others. And, you know, that connectivity and that bond is something that, you know, it's hard to, to put a finger on exactly what makes it so special, but it really does work. All of that to say, as a side note, something that's pretty exciting is we actually have a case, a Harvard Business School case that's being written about wow, Stride. Wow, wow. In the final, yeah, in the, in the final, uh, you know, reviews right now, a professor inbounded us about wanting to do a case that every first year student for the upcoming, you know, enrolling class of 2023 will have to read um, in, in years going forward. And so really special moment just for me personally um, and for the whole team. So well, congratulations, obviously, on multiple levels. Thank you. Um, and getting back to the, the question about Harvard Business School. So again, you, you had this incredible foundation and and you've focused seemingly on on the networking benefits of, of Harvard Business School and the connectivity. Was the education valuable? Yes, fair, totally fair question. I should have included that as well. So I will say, I think, you know, I had the luxury of studying at Warden for undergrad and taking business classes and working in finance. And so 
for me, the classes that were the most helpful, I, I would say in two, one, as far as actual just tactical classes were ones that I didn't have exposure to before. Things like yeah, tech sales, right? Turns out so much of my job is, you know, really understanding how do I structure deals and how do I think about making the right approach with different types of partners across our ecosystem or, or deals, an actual class called deals, which was negotiations meets law. And how do we think about, you know, credit structuring, right? Those were incredibly valuable. I also found a lot of the classes where we talked about not just the wins, but also the failures that different entrepreneurs have had incredibly useful so that I did not repeat the same mistakes, right? And I think all of this really comes together in the way that they taught the business school class through the case method that was completely different than what I experienced in undergrad, which is more so learning from a textbook, looking at a PowerPoint deck, more yeah. traditional. But I found the case method to be fascinating because our peer set just comes from such different backgrounds. I mean, you had everything from people who were in the military to people who worked in corporate arms of different companies across healthcare and energy and the like. And so to me, that was really interesting to be able to actually hear real life lessons from folks who got to see it firsthand. And for me to just absorb that way versus just through, you know, more of a rote memorization textbook style. Thank you. That was a great answer. It's a, it's yeah. a very comprehensive one. So thank you again. What would you have liked me to ask you? Yeah. Um, Either about Stride or about your experience at Harvard. Actually, I do have one question also after. Yeah, please. No, no, please. You go oh, me, all right. So you think about what I, what you would have liked me to ask you and I'll ask you what's, what, what do you see coming down the pike for Stride? What does the yeah. future hold? Yeah. For us right now, we're really focused on continuing to um, increase access for more students as we diversify our product set, expand into new types of programs, and then also go deeper with our existing students, right? So really thinking about, hey, you know, education financing is one of the first big quote unquote purchases that a student makes, but how do we think about what else these students need going forward on their path, right? There are really great tools like Mint to think about budgeting and financial wellness. What about when students open up a credit card? How do they think about the right features and benefits for them based on their financial position? And so a lot of this is through just really strong engagement and feedback loops from our own students to learn what else in their life roadmap can Stride be supportive of with because at the end of the day, again, we don't just want to be a provider. We want to be a partner with them. So Very nice. And then what would you have liked me to ask you? Yeah. Um, so I, 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 one of the things that I think is really interesting is around just thinking through what we learned from a collaborative sense at HBS and how that's impacted how I think about teams, leading oh, teams. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, Go for it. Yeah. So, you know, I think uh, for me, what was really fascinating beyond just the case method was the types of ways that HBS got us to work in these like very high functioning, very tight knit teams on a lot of different exercises. One of my favorites was the field class. They had us go abroad for 10 days and consult for a company. So I went to Vietnam and consulted for, you know, a, a company that creates dairy products, totally out of my wheelhouse, but it was such an amazing experience. And what was amazing is they taught us so much about understanding how you do launches with your team. You understand each other's working styles. You really think about how each person is motivated. What are they trying to get out of the class? Some people wanted to just learn and be on the field. The other people focus on getting the highest grade. What, what are your motivations for being here, right? And how do you most effectively work with the team as far as knowing your skill set and being able to stay engaged? And I think that's really worked with my team. I mean, I myself have evolved a lot. I went from wearing a lot of hats to now having a full executive team that, you know, I mean, we tripled our team size over the last year. And now knowing that if I am the best in, <laughs> if I'm the best in the room at any one topic, then I'm probably in the wrong room, right? And I think so much of it is about knowing that you're surrounding yourself with folks who are super high brilliance, low ego, and setting up the right environment for them to be very open about how they work best, what they're motivated by, and how I can help create that conducive ecosystem for them, right? So anyway, it's been amazing just um, taking those learnings and applying it here. That's wonderful. That's great. I like Thanks. to say that every so often I'll talk to a prospective client and they'll say, can I work with you? 
I haven't worked individually with, with clients in years. Yeah. Uh, I just don't have the time. It's not fair to them. It's not fair to me. And uh, I'll tell them with all seriousness and all honesty, I say, I hire people who are better than me. Yeah. You're better off working with the consultants that I've heard. Absolutely. So that's, yeah. that's the same idea. Yeah. hundred um, percent. Right. Tess, this has been absolutely delightful, fascinating. Congratulations on Stride success, your success. And I want to thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. I really appreciate your sharing your experiences and information and the great options that Stride offers, as well as your personal reflections on your experience at Harvard Business School. Where can listeners learn more about Stride funding? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, definitely check out the website. We actually just launched a totally rebranded website that I love. So it's stride at just like hit your stride, stridefunding.com. And uh, you can also email me at tess at stridefunding.com with any questions you have. And um, would love to just hear, you know, people's thoughts on what we're building, what else we could do and uh, how to really make a dent here. So wonderful. Thank you again. Listener, thank you too for tuning in to this, our 495th episode. If you are concerned that you missed something in today's show or want to take a note or two, but couldn't because you were driving, jogging, or doing something else, we've done it for you. You'll find the show notes for this episode at accept.com slash 495. Quick reminder, don't miss Accept It's November special with fantastic savings available provided you purchase by November 14th. The coupon code is saved now. Go to accepted.com and choose the service that's right for you. This is Admission Straight Talk produced by Accepted, and I'm your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week. <laughs>